And to end our GTAC, we have one last talk on test automation for Chrome OS and partners um, by Simron and Chris. Thank you. So, yeah, so uh, my name is Chris Sosa. And this is Simran Bossi. We're both software engineers on the Chrome OS team. Uh, today, we're going to give a talk on test automation for Chrome OS. And uh, before we start, we're going to give it a sort of quick uh, outline of our agenda. So uh, we we're going to start the talk off talking about sort of what Chrome OS is and sort of the history of Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. Uh, then I'm going to follow up with sort of an overview of the continuous integration that's sort of required to support the active development for Chromebooks. Um, next, uh, Simon is going to start giving an overview of testing and go into a life of a test. And Finally, we're going to finish off with some of the requirements for uh, our partners who test Chromebooks and Chromeboxes both before and after they give it to us, um, as well as MobLab, which is a productized version of our test automation services. So um, before uh, I start going too far, uh, I want to sort of remind everyone sort of what Chrome OS is, or for those of you who don't know, I'll tell you for the first time. Uh, so Chrome OS is a Linux-based uh, uh, distribution uh, that powers Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. Um, it was first created by the Chrome folks who sort of wanted to apply the three tenants of the Chrome browser to uh, operating system development. Uh, those three tenants are speed, security, and simplicity. So for an OS, speed means fast boot, fast performance. Um, security means um, being able to apply you know, zero day uh, patches, you know, within a day. Um, and uh, simplicity means, you know, uh, basically getting the OS out of the way. Like, you know, you shouldn't be aware that there's a BIOS running. You shouldn't be aware that Linux is running underneath. And most people don't, aren't aware. So uh, quick uh, history and sort of to understand the scale of the problem. Uh, we open source in 2009. We shipped our first Chromebook, uh, the CR48, in 2010. Uh, since 2010, we've basically shipped 2x more devices per year. Um, so at this point, we're actually shipping uh, over 50 distinct Chromebook and Chromebox variations across multiple architectures like x86 and ARM and various reference boards. Um, in terms of the, de develop the development community, uh, we have over 1,000 check-ins per week, not per day. I made that mistake. And uh, across uh, hundreds of Git projects. Um, and as part of supporting the three tenants of Chrome, one of the most important things is sort of keeping all the browsers and the operating system up to date. So we actually support uh, a, the new release every six weeks uh, to all Chromebooks and Chromeboxes in the field. In fact, the CR48 is still shipping, I guess, Chrome 47 at this point. Um, so what kind of development model does it take to support this? Uh, you know, being able to ship everything you've ever shipped on physical devices every six weeks is a pretty difficult problem. And on top of that, we actually have active development on all parts of the stack. So we have our own Linux distri distribution, which means we have a, a <coughs> kernel team that does active development on the kernel. So as some of you may know, a kernel kit change could very easily brick a device. And we've actually, so far, not bricked any devices. Um, so that's good. Um, and then uh, in order to support this, and sort of do this right, we've sort of taken sort of this continuous integration model that a lot of uh, web app developers have, which is basically keeping trunk in a, always a very good state and apply that to operating systems. That means we actually have a submit queue that gates any changes that might break or brick uh, any Chromebook or Chromebox uh, in active development, which is, I guess, all of them right now, because we still haven't hit the five-year cycle on the CR48. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, trunk is always in a near shippable state. Um, our branches are only for stabilization. All feature changes and all bug fixes must land on trunk first. And uh, before we talk about test automation, I wanted to give, a, give you a quick overview of the build system, because um, that sort of gives you a little bit of context about the test automation. Um, so we have a submit queue, as I mentioned. Uh, we actually do some building and testing on all 50 variants in the submit queue. Um, we actually do physical device testing as well as emulator testing. So we actually don't have to pick a side. Right? We have both physical device testing and emulator-based testing. And emulator-based testing helps a lot with sort of getting things fast and things quick. Uh, physical device testing is added on the submit queue to sort of help. Um, and it adds a lot of coverage. 
Um, so we also have release builders. Uh, these sort of do four canaries a day. Um, and they do a longer set of testing because the uh, requirements in terms of time um, aren't as intense. Like submit queue gates developers from checking things in, so that's got to be done pretty quick. And so we sort of aim for a 99% coverage on the submit queue, and we leave the 1% of slower tests to our release builds. And we also have uh, tribots, which are basically um, an infrastructure service that allows you to sort of emulate any of our bots that do builds or tests so that developers can sort of like, hey, my submit queue failed. I don't really quite understand. I don't have, you know, hey, a CR48 on my desk. How do I reproduce this? Hey, run a tribot, and it'll run both the build and the test in our physical lab. Um, as a point of reference, uh, we use BuildBot, um, which is an open source uh, waterfall continuous integration service. Um, in fact, actually, all of our infrastructure is open source uh, because all of Chrome OS is open source, and we sort of inherited that sort of being part of Chrome. So uh, Trunk, unlike some other open source projects, is actually open source. So all of our development is, is always in the public, uh, except for some small repos, small set of repos. Um, and yeah, most of the team interacts with our build system either through our code review system, like we post uh, breakages in the ch on the changes you upload, or on the BuildBot uh, web UI. Uh, and this is actually a quick view of what the BuildBot waterfall looks like. Um, all the columns are basically specific builds. Uh, BuildBot wasn't really meant to scale to have lots and lots of uh, builders on the same view, so this actually scrolls a very long way to the right. <coughs> um, but we do have some uh, quick overviews on top to sort of give you a high-level view. Uh, and uh, in terms of what a build does, here's a quick uh, diagram. We sync, we build, and then we run a bunch of different testing services in parallel, including physical device testing, uh, which actually leads us into the the actual meat of the thing where we talk about test automation on physical devices. Um, so uh, before I hand it off to Simran, I want to show you sort of a, a few pictures of our, uh, our automated test lab. So our automated test lab uh, currently consists of about 2,400 different Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. Um, right here, you sort of see uh, a lot of, I believe, Alex devices, which are a device we shipped four years ago. And uh, one of the interesting things to point out is that this thing here looks like a nice, exciting mess. That's actually a debug board that we have installed on every device. So one of the problems you get when you have um, thousands of devices under test is unless you want to hire a lot of people to go there to physically bring them back up when they break, like you need some sort of automated solution to actually automatically repair them. Um, this is only a big issue if you're doing uh, platform testing, because as I said, any kernel change can sort of brick a device. And you know, not every developer on the, on the team has 50 devices at their desk. That would be kind of crazy. Um, so we need some way to sort of uh, automatically repair them. So these debug boards are actually connected to um, all of our Chromebooks and Chromeboxes through a debug header. And it's able to sort of simulate um, the, re the automatic repair flow that if a consumer actually had a bad machine because uh, if either a, a small bug or something, they would activate this. Um, so uh, the, the bug board's also used for other development features. So it, it's used for battery testing and other things. So we actually sort of share it with other uh, development teams, especially on the lower end, like uh, the active development on the BIOS. Um, and then in these two pictures, uh, we show sort of what our racks looked like before on the left. Uh, before we add devices. And on the right, actually, um, so Chromebooks and Chromeboxes actively depend on you know, Wi-Fi connectivity for, uh, for use. So we need to find a really good way of doing functional and regression testing with Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth. And so these are actually RF isolation chambers. And uh, they do all of our functional testing. They're a little, they're a little bit expensive, so we try to keep and mock out as much of the, the Wi-Fi parts as possible. But they're actually capable. Uh, with these, we're actually able to sort of automatically uh, and programmatically um, emulate the change of distance if you're actually to move a device further away from a router. And we actually have both routers and uh, Chromebooks and Chromeboxes and these things. Um, so with that, I wanted to hand it, hand it off to Simran to talk right. about our test stuff. So. Testing on Chrome OS is done with the audit, um, 
by a fork of the Autotest testing framework. Autotest was originally designed for Linux kernel um, work, and we kind of forked it for hardware um, testing. Now, the reasons we chose Autotest is because it came with a bunch of things we knew we were going to need off the bat. The, to start with, that gave us host and job management. We have this lab of 2,500 devices, and we need a simple way to like manage each of them, look at their state, see what they're doing, and at the same time manage each job that's running. So Autotest gave us all this off the bat. It gave us a test scheduler to match to make sure that um, tests actually ran, monitor their status, and give us re results. It came with a web front end for all this as well, so that made it easier for us to get this up and going. And it came with a number of other services that we and, and ended up using. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the different kind of test coverage we do. Now, the most standard test that we run the, the most often is our build validation test. We call it the BVT, and pretty much it does regression testing. Now, this is, our, this is really important to us because our submit queue, our canary builds, everything runs the BVT. So anytime a developer wants to submit a change to Chrome OS, it has to pass all our basic set of regression testing before their change will commit to the tree. This is how we keep Chrome OS as green as possible. Then we do actual um, build, uh, full builds every day of all the changes that landed, and that also runs the BBT. If the tree goes red, we stop submitting changes, and it lets us um, fix everything up for developers. Next, we have Chromos release tests. So whenever we want to do a release, uh, so, um, we have people on our team, they choose a release, and then we run a series of tests against this um, specific build. The release testing is how we, is the, has to be done before we release anything. And a good example of this is our auto-update testing. We need to make sure that any um, update that we push out can also update um, to a new version should something go wrong. Without that, we will break devices, and that would be terrible. Um, next, we have power tests. So we can actually remotely turn off the power AC outlets to all the different Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. And that allows us to turn off the power and run its stress Wi-Fi testing and all sorts of testing to see the life of the battery, how long the devices last, and this, because this is a pretty big important part of selling laptops. La next we do um, hardware component testing. So, because um, Chrome OS, we manage the software stack, and Google is very closely tied to our partners. So any uh, components a partner wants to put in a new Chromebook, that has to be on our approved vendor list. So a good example of this would be um, internal SSDs. We'll actually do component testing and um, try to burn an SSD and see how long it l lives and make sure it's going to be good for a Chromebook. And lastly, we have fully automatic firmware tests. So inside each Chromebook is the Chrome embedded in controller. And the firmware test ensures that it can do all the stages of recovery and all the basic um, BIOS level stuff that we expect a Chromebook to do. So I'm going to go over the different servers we have in the lab. And pretty much um, a life of a test. So when a user wants to create a test, essentially either through our web front end or, um, uh, or through our suite scheduler or our Golo proxy, um, tests can be created. So an individual developer can request a test to be kicked off. Our suite scheduler runs our very slow tests regularly, like a nightly test or a weekly test, and it schedules it and ensures that it's kicked off. Um, and our builders, which Chris went over before, once they have placed a build into Google Storage, they, they'll talk to the proxy to kick off a job. Now, pretty much our RPC proxy just takes this request and translates it into a database entry, where it says, I want to run the BBT for, on this build for this device, which could be like a Samsung Chromebox i3, for example. And so once this entry is in the database, our infrastructure knows that it needs to get, um, run this test. This is where our host scheduler comes in. So we have these 2,500 devices. They're all in different states at any time. They can either be ready, they can be running a test, they could be verifying for a new test, or a bad state would be repair failed, where our automatic repair processes didn't work, and this device should not be used for testing. So the host scheduler looks at the database and sees what tests need to run. And it will say that the, the BBT that I suggested earlier wanted a Samsung Chromebox i3. And so it will look for a Samsung Chromebox i3 that is in the ready state and assign it to this job. At this point, the scheduler is, will now see that this um, test is ready to run. It has a host, and it will actually go through the process of scheduling this, um, kicking off this job and monitoring it. Now, the scheduler is probably our most important part of infrastructure, and it launches the test. It aborts jobs that might be hung, because they all have a timeout. If a job gets stuck for 24 hours, that means it's wasting resources and device, so it needs to abort jobs. It also manages all the different uh, other servers that are actually executing tests. 
So earlier when I was talking about auto tests, we actually support two different types of testing. Um, one type is called server-side tests, and these are tests that actually run the server and manipulate a device. Um, the most basic way to uh, the most basic test would be a reboot test. It would the test actually runs on our drone servers, and it would tell a device reboot, and it ensures that the device comes back up. And we would do this like ten reboots and make sure that the device comes up every time. Now the other type of test that we will run is a client-side test, and this is a test that actually executes on the device, but the drone is still responsible for kicking off that process and monitoring it, ensuring it doesn't get stuck. So the drones are actually the servers that are kicking off and monitoring all our tests. Now, like Chris was going saying earlier, all our builds are done um, on our builders, but we need to store them somewhere. So when a build is completed, it's, put in, it's placed into Google Storage, so that way our lab has access to it as well as our developers. Um, Google Storage is just a big back end that you can put a bunch of files if you're not familiar with it. Now, because of the, all the traffic and all the tests we're running, if we have 20 different Chromebooks trying to download the same image off of Google Storage, we'll kill our lab's network bandwidth. So for that, we developed these new servers called dev servers. They're essentially a cache to Google Storage, and we'll pull the image into the lab topology and store it there for 24 hours. The other thing the dev servers do is they actually um, emulate our normal uh, update Omaha servers. So that way, when the Chromebooks are flashing and installing a new image, it's as if they're actually going through the normal update process your Chromebook would normally do in the field. So if, for my previous uh, example, when the builder kicks off a test, it will actually, the, the device will now download that build from the dev server, which if it's not there, we'll get it from Google Storage, and then update before running the test. After the, after the tests have ran, we actually upload all the test result files back to Google Storage. This way, it's accessible to us and all the developers who need to see the logs should something fail. We actually st save almost all our test results for the last six months, so it's, if something goes wrong, we have something to compare against. Lastly, we, um, we need to keep scaling. Our lab keeps growing at, by the, um, exponentially with the number of devices. So for this, we have a concept of shards, which allows us to continually just add shards and let us scale without um, hitting our limits. So I just went over that, um, the topology of our lab. And we have all these different servers. And um, they all work together. And if I was to write a test, I could write a test that interacts with the dev server, the drone, the scheduler, the database to get information. And it gets really difficult for our external partners to replicate this should we find a failure and they need to, they need to create it to help fix the issue. So we came up with the idea of MobLab. Instead of having five servers, it's a single server that includes all those services and uh, replicates our lab. Pretty much the reason we needed MobLab is because of the time it takes, we're doing hardware to bring up, and the time it takes to, to go back and forth between us and our partners in Asia could take a long time. For example, a proto board is built, they send us the board, it takes seven days to ship, has to get through customs, then we find an issue, and then we have to tell them, and then they do another run, and this just adds up. So it lets them do the testing and replicate our lab on their end, and then they can, um, they, they, our testing is now scaled out to our partners as well, and it allows us to ship devices faster, which is good for Google and good for our hardware partners. So what is MobLab exactly? So essentially what we did is we took the basic Chromebox image and installed all the different service and services we required to run our lab infrastructure, and from there, we added all the logic to initialize and configure everything correctly so to, simplify, to make it as simple as possible. So this includes the Apache web server with the web interface, the same database structure that we use, Python, the dev server code that, so they can download images from Google Storage. That's actually really important because when we post images now, for, um, they can actually download them and test with the same exact images that we produce. And that includes um, the, all the other services that I mentioned before. Now, the great thing about it is it's actively developed by us. And whenever we do updates to the test framework, we can auto-update and push this out to our partners. And it's also cross-platform. So these are a couple basic examples of what our different partners might want to do. OEMs and ODMs are the people who are making the new laptops. And they want to start running the BBT on a brand new board is, would be a great way for them to verify how their, their hardware is doing. They can do stress testing. They might want to do the power load test before they choose a battery. And they also want to make sure that the firmware is correct. An SOC vendor like Intel might want to try um, different kernels or tr um, do regression testing against new kernel changes. Or generally, they make a reference board that they actually don't ship a Chromebook, but other partners like Dell or HP will build a Chromebook around. 
hardware component vendors. They want to sell their, um, their different components to OEMs, and they can't unless we approve it. So by giving um, a model app to say like SanDisk, they can do SSD validation, send us the test results, because they go back to Google Storage and we can see them. And we can say whether this new part is valid to be used in Chromebooks. And lastly, BIOS vendors want to make sure that their BIOS works with our firmware. So the benefits of MobLab for our partners is it's really easy to set up. Pretty much they just take a Chrome box, put, install the image, and everything should set up uh, properly. Um, it's a common test framework. The great thing about this is should we find a failure, we can just tell them what test to run and they can reproduce it at their site. Before, it, if we try to do it with our workstation versus their workstation, different setups, different operating systems, they might not be reproducible. The faster debug cycles, now that we can easily do these reproduction, is a great benefit to everybody involved. Um, well, these partners also get all the tool benefits that we got out of AutoTest, because they can manage all the different devices they have, as well as easily kick off the tests. And like we said, it's auto-updated by us. And the really great thing is, it's open source. If they have ideas or changes they want to do, they can create a CL and change it and upload it for us to review, and it'll become part of the MobLab platform. This is an um, example of a lab setup that a partner might do. So the Chrome box in the middle is the actual MobLab device. And we only have a few requirements to, to get it going. One is internet access. Um, because a lot of these factories are based in China, that might imply mean VPN access, so that way they can access Google services. Um, the reason they need to access our services is one, for Google storage. That's where our builders will give them the images they can test. And two, they need access to the AU server, so should there be an update, they can actually download the update and get the new infrastructure that we've been building. Next on the side, you can see they, we have a test subnet. And pretty much, we just add, tell them add another um, Ethernet interface and then add a switch, and you can hook up all your test devices there, and our system knows to, to test those devices on that network. And then from their own corporate network, they can use their own laptop and kick off the tests. Now, Chris was, um, showed you guys early in the photo that servo board. We actually give these to our partners, so that way they can run our full suite of tests. And that also is supported with the MobLab setup. So if they, should their devices also need to be repaired, they can, it would automatically happen. So beyond just Chrome OS, MobLab has been, has been applied to a number of other platforms. OnHub actually did all their testing by using MobLab devices. They created a quick lab out of a couple MobLabs, and they were able to get going. Um, Brillo, which is going to be Google's um, Internet of Things platform, is going to be supported by MobLab, and Android support is coming up as well. Some additional features that, um, that MobLab gives you. Um, custom OS image support. So this allows our, our partners to actually do their own custom images. Say they want to change the kernel version. They can actually create a whole their own custom image and with the new kernel, and then they, they can actually run, run all our tests against it. Custom test support. They can write their own tests, and before they even submit the test into our tree, they can, test, they can run the test and make sure they work and validate it. Private test repository support. So you can actually keep your tests outside of our, open, outside of our sources and still run them. This is great because Onhub is open source, or uh, Modlab is open source, but Onhub was not, so their tests are closed source. We actually um, have virtual machine support, so to look, make it easier for people to get Modlab set up. And we actually have a, um, a tool called Mob Monitor, which simplifies setup and lets people know when things go wrong. Uh, anyway, uh, as, as Herman and I said, uh, Chrome OS is sort of based on Chrome OS, which is a fully open source project. So if you have any more questions, uh, there's our discuss list. Uh, feel free to send an email. Um, all of our documentation is online. And uh, our fork of AutoTest uh, is actually also publicly available. So feel free to check it out. Any questions? Thanks, guys. Um, so what, ki what type of bugs do the real device tests find that emulator tests don't? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Those are things that are hard to test with them. Uh, a lot of kernel bugs, actually. So a lot of kernel bugs. Um, there's a lot of stuff with, with when you have the, uh, the emulator, like the touchpad is emulated. So any kind of touchpad regressions you have, you won't have it. it, it it's part of a, you could theoretically like, fix this problem by re-implementing all the, the, the low-level device driver stuff to also work in the emulator. but. Uh, Basically, we usually don't because that requires twice the amount of development work. 
Um, so anything basically low level is not caught by the emulators. Uh, greater than 100 Git repos, question. Um, how are those synchronized? Do they depend on each other at head? Are branches required, perhaps for different hardware or Chromium versions? Uh, so our commit queue creates a snapshot uh, of the, the repo manifest. So we use repo, which is basically a way of working with a bunch of other Git projects to sort of collectively have one giant source tree. Um, Android uses the same thing. Uh, if you create a snapshot of that, it right, flags all the hashes down. And so you basically have a fixed version of trunk. Um, so that's what our commit queue uses. And for any releases, uh, we always generate a uh, we always generate a snapshot that we actually distribute to all of our builders building the same can canary at the same time. So that, that's how we get around that. How many bugs appear only in physical devices versus passing in emulators? A lot of them. <laughs> I mean, so the thing is, emulators, uh, if you think about it, we have 50 variations of Chromebooks and Chromeboxes. Emulators cut down that amount of variation you'll see in tests quite a bit. Um, they're really good. Like if you have like a regression in the browser, say, like oh, emulators will catch that almost 100% of the time. Uh, if you have anything that's like a low-level service talking to any kind of other low-level low service, emulators aren't going to catch it. And so, the thing is, emulators like usually prevent those kind of changes ever from reaching the hardware test because we kind of have a tiered uh, system of, in, in testing. So like, it's kind of hard to say because I'd have to look at only emulator changes versus only physical device changes. But I mean, they're both very valuable. Um, is the most I can say without spending a long time looking at all the logs. Awesome test lab. But 2,400 machines, wow. Any thoughts or plans to streamline the number of machines for tests? It's just going to keep growing. <laughs> <laughs> so the opposite? Yeah, I think we have a set number that we require for every new device. Yeah, we have a set number, and um, a, a lot of it's sort of up to the software. Uh, well, I guess we're all, we are the same team. But a lot of it's up to basically how we choose to develop, right? Um, because we have a unique image per device, um, the software is unique per device because we're trying to keep the image as small as possible to make uh, to sort of keep the, the speed tenant in Chrome. Um, it, it's really hard. Like, if you were to, of course, have a lot more generalized drivers that applied equally, you might be able to get more coverage without having all the devices. And we're actually thinking about potentially reducing the number of devices we need for follower devices. So usually with kind of device development, you have a reference board that has most of the, the drivers spec'd out. But then uh, individual partners might, say, change the, uh, they might have the exact same thing from another partner, but it's an, it's an i5 instead of an i3. In those cases, we can use a lot fewer devices. Um, in terms of like, the fact that we really don't want to break anyone in the field, we do want a small amount of coverage at least, but we could definitely uh, get away with fewer. Uh, have you considered something else to manage the test lab instead of auto test? For example, beakerproject.org used by Red Hat and Fedora. We've looked at other frameworks, but we're kind of so ingrained to auto test that we've kind of stuck with it. Yeah, we're, we're pretty open-minded, but a lot of our, uh, especially since we're both part of a continuous integration team, a lot of it, a lot of our work has been scaling out AutoTest, um, and a lot of the services we built are in the fork of AutoTest we use. And so, like we, for example, uh, uh, Simran talked about sharding, which is basically one of the big problems with AutoTest is that it schedules everything on one thread, and like when you have 2,400 devices running, it, you know, hundreds of thousands of tests. You know, one thread can only do so much. And so we've actually distributed and sharded out the work of like matching host to tests, um, which we probably are looking at to upstream, but we haven't yet. So uh, we're definitely open to it. And AutoTest uh, is a great framework. It's not perfect. Um, so we're always open to look at other things. How do you do battery tests? So we have these um, p big power outlets that actually are running Linux, and um, each our lab topology is set up so each device is plugged into the correct outlet. So a server-side test, like I mentioned before, can request, hey, turn this device on this rack, uh, this rack, this row off, and then the power will actually be disconnected. And at the end of the test, we do clean up and ensure that the power is restored. But pretty much, that's how we can kill the, kill the AC remotely and do the battery testing. Uh, how complex do the 
power tests or battery tests get. For example, is the battery duration tested while watching videos, playing HTML5 or JavaScript intensive games? And do you ever open bugs against Chromium for dis decreasing battery life? I'm not too sure the specifics of the power test, to be honest. Yeah, so our, our, our uh, software model is to have, uh, we provide the infrastructure. Uh, individual developers on the sub teams do all the, uh, the actual testing. So the, the power team would be able to answer that question a lot better. Well, we are now out of time. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>